The theme of this week is abstraction. A group was an abstract pattern, an abstract structure. I defined it to show how matrices and transformations can fit into the structure, to show how a group can capture the idea of symmetries on an object. In this last video for this week, I want to push forward in another abstract direction. Instead of talking about groups, I want to talk much more holistically about what we've accomplished so far in this course. I started this course talking about Rn, Euclidean space. I said this was a geometry course, and I wanted to understand Euclidean space and its structures. Well, what structures have I found? I found addition of vector and scalar multiplication. I found linear combinations of vectors and spans. I found linear independence. I found subspaces. I found transformations. And these are not the only structures, but these are the ones that I care about for the moment. Like the idea of a group that I defined in the previous videos, these structures are a pattern. The set has these ideas. And we've done a lot of work with these ideas. It would be nice if that work were applied as broadly as possible. This is the main strength of abstraction. While it's harder on the brain, it applies broadly. If I abstract a structure, I can use it in many places, even if it is harder to understand than a concrete instance. So I ask, what else has these structures? What is, while not strictly about vectors, a set of things that I can add and multiply by scalars, for which I can look at linear combinations and spans, for which I can make subspaces and transformations? Well, a few things occur. I can add polynomials and multiply them by scalars. And the same is true for functions or for infinite series. Can I understand linear algebra in these places? I'd like to, since I'd like to be able to use all this language, linear independence, linear combination, span, subspace, transformation. How do I do all this? Well, I get this definition. Euclidean space is a space of vectors. Its entries are vectors and they have vector properties. To drop having actual vectors, but to keep the structure, I define an abstract vector space. This is no longer a set of vectors, but a set of things that act sort of like vectors. It is a set with an operation, much like a group was, and the operation is usually written as addition, and it is assumed to be both associative and commutative. It also has multiplication, but only by scalars. Since there are those two things here, I also need to know the interaction, and a vector space must have a distributive law for scalar multiplication over addition. a times u plus v is au plus av. For uv in the abstract vector space and a is scalar, whatever those uv happen to be. That's it. That's the definition. In this context, I can extend the ideas of linear algebra. Linear combinations come from scalar multiplications and additions. Spans come from linear combinations. I can define and investigate functions that preserve the operations and see what I get. In any abstract vector space, I can use the very useful language of linear algebra. This adds great value to everything done in this course. All the work done to understand spans, linear independence, linear combination, all that work can now be used for any abstract vector space. Before I get to examples, I also must note that something is lost. In any abstraction process, by abstracting the structure, some particulars are left behind. So what is lost here? Well, most obviously, abstract vector spaces are no longer strictly about vectors. The things in an abstract vector space are not necessarily lists of numbers as vectors are. Losing explicit vectors means losing the geometric interpretation, for the most part. The elements of an abstract vector space may no longer have the geometric meaning of vectors. In particular, the whole structure of loci may be gone, or at least radically changed. The matrix interpretation of transformations came from the matrix action on vectors. For other objects, that might not work anymore, or at least not as easily so the linear transformations may no longer be represented as matrices. And since both matrices and geometry are possibly gone, ideas like impact on size and volume probably don't make sense anymore, so determinants are also lost. Finally, and most interestingly, the finite dimensional nature of Rn may also be lost. 
these abstract vector spaces may be infinite dimensional. In fact, all of the examples I'm going to get to are infinite dimensional. This seems very strange, so let me get into the examples to try to explain. The first example is what I'll write here as P of R, the abstract vector space of polynomials in the variable x with real coefficients. An abstract vector space has to have addition, and indeed, I can add polynomials. It has to have scalar multiplication, and I can multiply a polynomial by a scalar and it is still a polynomial. And the distributive law still works here as well. So this is an abstract vector space. This means that the language applies to polynomials. I can ask for a linear combination of polynomials. I can construct the span of a set of polynomials. I can ask for a basis. I can determine if polynomials are linearly independent. And I can construct a linear transformation of polynomials. This is an infinite dimensional vector space. What does that mean? Well, Dimension of a vector space is equal to the number of things in a basis. R3 was three-dimensional since it has the standard basis of three axis vectors. What is the basis for polynomials? Well, any polynomial is a constant plus something times one plus something times oh, sorry, plus something times x plus something times x squared and so on up to whatever degree the polynomial stops at. Each polynomial stops somewhere but I can consider a polynomial of any degree n. Therefore, 1, x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, and so on, is a basis. All x to the n are here, all infinitely many. The basis has infinitely many things, and they are all linearly independent. Therefore, the dimension is infinite. This is the major region, reason that the geometric interpretation fails. What does an infinite dimensional vector space mean geometrically? Probably not very much, but that's all right, since using the terminology of al linear algebra for polynomials is already a huge win. It makes working with polynomials easier in many contexts, and that's really the power of this whole idea of abstract vector spaces, to be able to use the ideas of linear algebra in any place that has a minimum linear structure to allow it. I have two more examples for you. Similar to polynomials, I can ask for the set of convergent infinite series in the variable x with real coefficients. This is written C infinity of R for reasons that I won't talk about now. If I have two convergent series defined for all of R, I can add them up by adding the terms. Likewise, I can multiply a series by a constant by taking that constant into the series, and this doesn't affect convergence. The distributive law holds for this scalar multiplication over addition, this is an abstract vector space. I can take linear combinations and spans of infinite series, all the things I've talked about before. This is again an infinite dimensional vector space. What is its basis? This is actually quite hard to say. You might think I could say the same thing as polynomials, 1, x, x squared, and so on. It's true, every power series is a sum with coefficients multiplied by these terms. However, it's an infinite sum. And here is a strange subtlety, one that I haven't yet had to deal with. In all of the sums of linear algebra, such as the sums that make up linear combinations, the sums must be finite. I never had to worry about this with actual vectors, since infinite sums of vectors didn't arise, and if they had, I don't think they're actually that useful for what we're doing. But here, the series is defined by an infinite sum. A basis would have to be some special set of series such that every other series would be a finite combination of the basis elements. It can't be an infinite combination of 1x, x squared. That's not how basis works, since basis is worked based on <laughs> finite sums. So what is a basis? Well, that's a very hard thing to say. Finally, I want to consider the set of all continuous functions defined on all of R. I can add continuous functions, multiply them by scalars, and the multiplication is distributive over the addition. This is an abstract vector space. This is an extremely large vector space. Continuous functions have a huge variety. Any connected path I draw that satisfies a vertical line test is the graph of a continuous function. This is certainly infinite dimensional, and I can't even imagine thinking about a basis. 
I won't prove it, but the dimension here is actually uncountably infinite, for those of you who know what that term means. Even though this is an enormous set, as an abstract vector space, I can use the language of linear combinations, spans, subspaces, transformations, so on. And again, this is very useful. As an example, in the solutions to differential equations, the solution space is often a set of functions. So in many instances, this set can be described as the span of finitely many functions. It has a dimension. I need to find linearly independent functions to span this solution space. All this linear algebra language gets used to describe solutions to differential equations. So let me recap. Linear algebra gives many useful definitions and tools. Linear combinations, spans, bases, linear transformations, image, kernels, etc. I want to use these terms wherever I can, wherever they are useful. Since I put in the effort to learn this language, I want to use it as widely as possible. Therefore, I define an abstract vector space as an abstract structure where these terms still work. This big idea is one of the main reasons that, after calculus, linear algebra is the next core subject of university mathematics. It's taught for actual vectors and matrices, absolutely, but it's also taught for the language that applies to abstract vector spaces, and it can be used in all these other settings, like polynomials, power series, and functions.